Welcome to this SIAC career webinar on unresponsive and uncooperative parties. My name is Stephen Lim. I practice as an international arbitrator. I'm the moderator for this session. While arbitration is founded in consent, many of us would have experienced situations where arbitration is not conducted with the consensual ethos. It may be a party chooses not to participate in the proceedings from the start or subsequently, or a party can intentionally be obstructive in the arbitration procedure, aiming to delay the arbitration. Parties have been seen to be even more actively obstructive, taking up unmeritorious challenges against tribunal members or parallel court proceedings to disrupt the arbitration. There have even been instances where civil or criminal proceedings are threatened or commence against parties, counsel, or the arbitrators just to stymie the arbitration. We will be discussing these situations in the course of this webinar, drawing from the deep experience of our panelists. This is not a topic to be dryly dealt with in textbooks. It benefits much more from practice and experience than theoretical knowledge of legal precepts. Although, of course, the bedrock of due process is the foundation on which any response to obstructive behavior must be based. Now, having ex mentioned the experience of the panelists, it is time for me to introduce them. I will keep introductions brief since they are all well known in international arbitration and in Korea. I will begin with Dr. Michael Pryles. Michael is, of course, a very, very well known international arbitrator. And importantly for today's proceedings, he was former chairman of the SIAC and founder president of the SIAC Court of Arbitration. Next, we have Dr. Yoon Yong Park. EY, as he's commonly known, is co-chair of the litigation and arbitration group at Kim and Chang. He has led many international arbitration and cross-border disputes. He regularly sits as an arbitrator in international arbitration cases. Uh, and EY is a member of the SIC Court of Arbitration. And we have Robert Wachter with us as well. Robert is co-head of international arbitration at Lee and Co, and one of the co-founders of KCAB Next, which promotes the development of the next generation of Korean arbitration practitioners. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, one of the few in Korea. This is a little known fact, but Robert has shared with me that when he first arrived in Korea, he moonlighted in Korean television and was an extra in about a dozen Korean dramas playing a surgeon, US Army soldier, CIA, and lawyer. Today, he plays lawyer for real. And we have uh, Julia Yu with us as well. Julia is a partner of Unan Bazul in Singapore. She's also on the faculty of the Kyushu University Graduate School of Law in Japan. She's a member of the Korean Bar Association and a registered foreign lawyer in Singapore. Our fifth panelist today is Samuel Chuckle. Samuel is a chartered arbitrator, an accredited adjudicator and mediator, and as an active international arbitration practice, he is founder director of Ledger's Point LLC and heads his dispute resolution practice. We have divided this webinar into two parts. In the first part, I will ask our panelists to tell us about memorable experiences or war stories they have had in dealing with unresponsive and uncooperative parties. In the second part, we will look at some examples of unresponsive, uncooperative, or obstructive behavior. Our panelists will discuss how these can be dealt with from the perspective of counsel and also arbitrator. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. Please use that to submit your questions. We will try to answer as many as we can as we proceed through the session. Now let's move into the first part of a webinar well, panelists will set the scene with their war stories. Michael, would you like to kick us off, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Stephen. I thought I'd start with a, a rather bland story and uh, talk about reservation of rights. Uh, I recall a number of years ago being in an arbitration, quite a complicated one, where um, a, a number of procedural points arose uh, constantly throughout the arbitration uh, and one counsel in particular was 
unhelpful, uh, reluctant to agree to anything, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately made things a little difficult. Anyway, at an early stage in the arbitration, it became clear that the parties were not agreed on the governing law. And there were a number of discrete issues, and it was alleged that some of these issues were governed by different laws. So uh, after um, uh, deliberating with the parties, it was agreed that the tribunal would, as a preliminary issue, determine choice of law. We heard the parties and we handed down our award. It wasn't to the liking of this particular council. And following that, every letter which was sent to us by her had at the bottom of it a statement saying, we disagree with the tribunal's decision in the first award and we reserve our rights. And that was put on every single letter from this uh, council. And there were many, many emails from her. Now, I thought the clever thing to do was to say nothing. Bite your tongue as a good arbitrator does when subject to a little annoyance from counsel, which happens occasionally. So I did that for the first year, year and a half. And then I thought, no, enough is enough. So I, I then wrote to her um, at the bottom of one of my emails saying, I noticed you've uh, many times expressed your um, lack of agreement with the first award and on each occasion you've reserved your rights. I said, frankly, uh, whether you agree with the first award or not is not helpful to this tribunal. The issue has been decided. That was the end of that one. Then on another occasion, uh, I was uh, sitting in an arbitration in Singapore and uh, an arbitrate and a counsel who I had taught many years earlier was acting as counsel for a Chinese party. And he evidently thought it um, desirable and perhaps um, uh, well, highly desirable to put at the foot of every one of his letters, we reserve our rights again and again and again and again. He obviously didn't understand the meaning or use of the term. And again, I thought I will bite my tongue and say nothing. At the hearing, the uh, parties, or one party asked to change the order in which the witnesses were to be examined. And an email was sent to this council and he said, yes, he would agree to the change of order but he reserved all rights. At the hearing next day, I thanked counsel for agreeing to the change, but I said to him that I was a little perplexed and I, wonder, I wondered what rights he was reserving in relation to an agreed change of order of witnesses, which he had certainly agreed to. After that, he no longer reserved his rights. Don't antagonise arbitrators and uh, just say things which are sensible in so far as you can and be helpful. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Michael. It, it, it's an interesting story and it's actually much uh, more common <clears throat> than perhaps you may think. And I have a situation as well where a party constantly reserves its rights, uh, even with regard to an extension of time application. So <laughs> it is quite common. But let's, let's move on and hear from uh, EY. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, <clears throat> I would talk about the dispute that I had with a, one of the Southeast Asian companies. Um, uh, when dispute arises, the, um, we expected that the, it would be arbitrated in Korea because the arbitration clause has uh, arbitration seated in Seoul, Korea. Uh, surprisingly, the other side actually neglected the arbitration and they filed the litigation in uh, one of the Southeast Asian countries. So we, we had a, a serious issues, whether we should neglect the litigation and go to the arbitration directly in Seoul, Korea, or should defend. The problem was that the uh, litigation in the country 
where the um, you know respondent has filed had gone very speedy. So we had to appear to at least uh, submit a defense of uh, existence of arbitration clause. So naturally you make a submission that the, uh, it has to be subject to arbitration. But the problem that we had was um, the proceeding was not bifurcated. So the uh, litigation was not uh, divided and judge did not make any decision as to the jurisdiction. So we had to defend our position on the merit phase as well, because the litigation um, that we had to deal with was that the judge deal with both jurisdiction as well as the merits. So we had to face a serious problem, whether we should go uh, further as to uh, the merit to defend our position. In that case, we may have a waiver issue but if we neglect it, then probably they may have a speedy decisions and they may uh, you know, enforce the judgment uh, against the assets that we have in that country. So we made a reservation and then we had to defend our position that there's always an issue as to how much we should uh, keep in terms of our submission and the merits. While we had to do the arbitration in Korea, so there has been a peddler litigation and arbitration, but we had to deal with the you know, Indonesian litigation as well. Now, one issue that we had was a potential injunction against our client as well as uh, even counsel, because we heard the story that in some Southeast Asian countries, there's an injunction against an individual who do the uh, arbitration outside of the country. So uh, we were a bit concerned, maybe it, it might not be a real issue, but we wanted to stay outside of the country, not to go there. Rather, we met outside of the country for the consultation so that we wouldn't have any uh, potential issue with the injunction. So um, good story is that we were able to resolve all these issues in the arbitration in uh, Korea. So, but it, it has a really uh, long story to resolve all these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuvai. Um, uh, Samuel, yes, you share your stories with us. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm going to talk about two situations where I was involved as counsel for parties in an arbitration. Uh, in the first, I was acting for a claimant who had sold helicopters to a party in Indonesia. And these helicopters were essentially on lease, so there were monthly payments. and respondents in Indonesia had been paying regularly until such time as they decided they weren't going to pay. Uh, but they had been communicating with my clients and saying, yeah, they will pay and so on and so forth. But ultimately, my client decided to start arbitration proceedings in Singapore. And the moment we did that, the party in Indonesia just went very quiet. Uh, there was no response. The arbitrator was appointed. Um, there was effectively no communication with the Indonesian party. So what we had to do to ensure that any award obtained would be enforceable in Indonesia was to, in a sense, make sure that all the procedural steps, both in relation to the initiation of the proceedings, the service of the papers, and the local procedural laws were complied with. And to that extent, we had to get an Indonesian counsel to advise us, and we had to submit to the arbitrator on what were the appropriate steps and orders that he had to make uh, to, to ensure that the award was given was ultimately enforceable. Long story short, eventually we got the award. Uh, we had it after some months registered in the Jakarta District Court and lo and behold, the respondent on the other side ultimately concedes, can't really resist the enforcement and eventually there was a settlement. So if you've got an unwilling or hesitant party, make sure that you take whatever steps required to ensure that from the perspective of enforceability in the country where you're going to seek enforcement, you comply with the local requirements. Second instance where uh, I acted as counsel, which I want to talk about, is where unfortunately or fortunately I was acting for the party who was rather reluctant to be involved in the arbitration. Uh, and again, for some reason it was an Indonesian party. And the claimant in this case was a huge Japanese multinational. And the arbitration was to be held in Tokyo under the JCAA rules. So being instructed not to, as far as possible, engage with the arbitration proceedings, I had 
to be as creative as I could within the permissible boundaries to try and get as much extensions of time upon extensions of time in terms of filing our responses, filing our positions and so on with the arbitrator. All credit to the arbitrator, he was very even-handed, he was very fair, where he felt extensions of time should be granted, he gave extensions of time and that allowed me to persuade the client that the process was a fair one and that they would get a fair hearing even if they were going to be litigating in the territory of their opponent. And again, happy story to end with because uh, we went into the arbitration in Tokyo and quite happily resolved uh, in a very satisfactory manner from the perspective of the client. So moral of the story, where you have a client who tries, who, who is uncomfortable with the process and instructs you to delay processes, try and find ways and means to show how that process actually can work for the client and ultimately benefit that client. Thank you, Sivik. Thank you very much, Samuel. Thanks for sharing with us candidly a situation where you've had to persuade an unresponsive or uncooperative party to, to be uh, a, a responsive party. Uh, let's now hear from uh, Robert. Sure, I, I have a few war stories to share uh, for cases where I was representing a, a claimant and the respondent uh, didn't show up. Uh, and, and you would think that in a case like that, um, there wouldn't be a whole lot to say. I mean, what, what can happen? Um, how hard can it, can it be? Uh, it's supposed to be an easy case if, uh, if one side doesn't show up. But in my experience, there have been some things that, that I was not expecting uh, that in hindsight have made me a better lawyer. Um, one example, when, when I was at a much earlier stage in my career, one of my first cases as, as lead counsel at the hearing, I, I, I thought if the other side doesn't show up, this is going to be easy, gave a, a quick summary of the case. And there was a, a, an English QC as the chair who, after I finished my summary presentation, said, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. Now, can you please take us through the evidence, exhibit by exhibit, and point out to the tribunal exactly what part of these exhibits you want us to focus on for purposes of drafting the award. Uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't ready to do that. It never dawned on me that I should have at my fingertips uh, a highlighted version of all of the exhibits showing exactly what I was relying on that exhibit for. And so that's changed my practice since then. Even when the respondent does show up, we make sure that we have an annotated version of all of the exhibits so that we can point to exactly what it is in the evidence that we are asking the tribunal to, to look at and rely on. In, in another case where I showed up at the hearing, this time I had all of the exhibits uh, heavily annotated, uh, gave the, uh, the introduction uh, and a, a well-known chair, uh, once we got to the, uh, to the first witness, uh, said, uh, now I know, uh, Mr. Walker, that in the procedural order, we said that the uh, witness statements would stand as the direct testimony. But as the respondent is not here, I think that it would be appropriate uh, to, to go through with the witnesses and have you elicit their direct testimony and, and put that directly into the record, which is easy enough if you know that that's coming. But I, I had to stop and, and think, what are all of the details that this particular witness has testified about? And you need to sort of reset to think about how to bring all of that out again at the hearing. Um, from these experiences, it, it taught me that you can't go into a hearing um, unprepared. Even if the other side is not there, you have to know your case, you have to know the evidence, you have to know what your witnesses have testified. So then there was another case where the pendulum sort of swung, where um, I, I stepped into a case in the middle and I, I was hearing warnings from other team members that the sole arbitrator that had been appointed in that case um, didn't get along and was arch enemies with another lawyer at the firm in a different department. Uh, but the concern was, uh, is this arbitrator because of that difficult relationship where these lawyers were known to shout at each other on the phone and hang up on, on one another? I mean, if it had been a challenge situation, you know, in the, in the IBA rules, there's the orange list um, condition where there might be enmity between the arbitrator and counsel. Uh, th this was an example where there might have been enmity, not, not with anyone appearing in the arbitration, so there was no challenge. But 
the warning was you have to be ready because this arbitrator might have it out for us and make a, give us a very difficult time. And so I was probably more prepared for that, that hearing with a non-appearing respondent uh, than any other. Uh, and we got there and, and that was not the case at all. The arbitrator was very professional, just asked a few questions. There was just a little chit chat. Um, but I, I've learned the lesson that, um, that you have to be prepared in these cases uh, and you can't take it for granted that the uh, tribunal is just going to rubber stamp everything. So there's, I, I've learned that there's a, a disconnect because you, on one hand, have an expectation that costs should be very low in a case where the other side doesn't show up. But if the tribunal is expecting that claimant's counsel uh, appears uh, fully prepared, then um, that's going to require a, an investment of time and energy. Thank you, Robert, for that. And uh, you, you've touched on an issue and how, how do we deal with uh, non-participating parties, which we'll be picking up later when we move to the second part of this webinar. Uh, but let's hear from Julia now. Uh, okay, so uh, I have uh, two cases where um, eventually uh, the respondent didn't participate in arbitration proceeding. Uh, the first case was some years ago, uh, we had a respondent to disrupt arbitration. Uh, we were acting for a foreign party against a Thai party in an arbitration seated in Bangkok, Thailand. After a few hearings that day, uh, it became clear to the Thai respondent that they were going to lose the arbitration. The next morning, when everyone came to the arbitration venue, which is the hotel meeting room, the Thai police were there. The police threatened to jail all the foreigners, including arbitrators, claimants counsel, and foreign witnesses for illegally working in Thailand without a work permit and gave us 24 hours to leave the country. The tribunal had no choice but to have the, the case part heard and all foreigners left Thailand that day. Subsequently, the tribunal continued the hearing in Singapore but the Thai respondent refuses to attend and participate anymore. And the second case was, um, again, this is about the non-participating respondent, but we successfully uh, get uh, the enforceable award uh, from the Chinese court. There was an arbitration case where a claimant is a Korean company and the respondent is a Chinese company under the SIC rules. The notice of arbitration was filed, uh, but there was no response from the respondent. And the claimant had requested for the expedited procedure and that application was accepted by SIC. And then the chairman of SIC then appointed arbitrator. During the process, despite the fact that the respondent had, uh, had been given numerous opportunities to participate in the arbitration, the respondent had not taken any step or participated in any way in this arbitration. The claimant filed a state on statement of claim and witness statement, and a an one-sided oral hearing was conducted by the tribunal without respondent. Another three months later, a signed award was issued to the parties ordering the Chinese party to compensate money with interest together with the arbitration fees to SIC. Then the Korean company applied to the Chinese court for the recognition of the award. The Chinese party who did not participate at all in arbitration proceedings finally defended that they will not pay that money because there were no related clauses in the sales contract regarding the set arbitration fees and legal fees, and their non-performing the contract was caused by government intervention of the market price, and they now had no money to satisfy the arbitration award. But the Chinese court decided to recognize the SIC arbitration award for the reason that, first, the China has already acceded to the, uh, to the New York Convention, and this is a commercial dispute case that can be resolved by arbitration. And the second, the respondent has not stated any reason why the said arbitration award shall be refused to be recognized as per the New York Convention. And 
the court has reviewed this case and there is no violation of any public policy in this respect. Accordingly, the said arbitration award of the SIC shall be recognized and enforced. That was the successful story from the claimant's uh, counsel's point of view. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Julia. Uh, your story about uh, Thailand uh, reminds me actually of, of many other stories I've heard and, and I've also sat in Thailand where there was perhaps a, a threat uh, that if anybody didn't have their work permit in place, uh, that there would be issues. So when I sat in Thailand, I made sure that I had my work permit. It was in my in the pocket of my jacket when I went for that hearing. Uh, and we, we have one question that's come in and that's uh, directed to EY uh, on, on the situation that you related to us. And the question, EY, is whether you could have applied for an anti-suit injunction from the C court ordering the respondent to withdraw the litigation in the Southeast Asian country. And do the Korean courts not grant anti-suit injunctions? Was that not an option for you? That was um, a big issue for us to consider. The simple answer is no. If we file an anti-suit injunction with the Korean court, probably you might not get that. Uh, there weren't efforts uh, for, a, for a while, but it appears that the Korean court, uh, I think that the way Korean court uh, takes uh, toward arbitration is let the arbitration proceed and uh, honor the autonomous of the arbitration. So then court would wait until the award is rendered. At that point, they can determine whether the award is enforceable or set aside. In terms of uh, injunct uh, issuing an injunction against the party to not to do the litigation outside because of arbitration, the form and the, you know, the type of the relief is not much recognized in our country because of the civil law system. So probably in some days we may be able to persuade the court, but we haven't had such a precedence yet. So that would be a big issue for us, whether we can use Korean court decision uh, against the you know, Indonesian uh, court proceedings or the, against the respondent. One other option that we have considered is to get the anti-suit injunction from the arbitrators who would sit on the arbitration in Korea. That was actually considered, but uh, that's a possible if the arbitrator is um, familiar with this uh, arbitration system, especially they are from the common law countries. But if you have a civil law arbitrators, I think that they might be also be concerned that uh, whether such a type of injunction would be amenable within the legal system in Korea. Thank Stephen, you. could I, yeah. could yes, I please, come in? Yes. Um, EY, I was interested in your comment that the Korean courts uh, take a, a position that they should just leave the arbitration to, without interfering with it, and let it uh, let the tribunal get on with whatever they need to do. But most uh, uh, most countries would also recognise that there's an obligation. Uh, on courts to assist arbitrations. And of course, that's recognized in the international instruments. Um, and uh, is, that not, is that not a principle that's accepted in um, Korea? It's accepted, you're right. Under the model law, uh, we adopted the model law, uh, 1999, 1985 model law. In the model law, the Arbitration Act, uh, pretty much arbitration and uh, um, litigation are somehow insulated and to be away from each other, especially Korean court were very much indifferent, take a, a indifferent position toward arbitration. Once we enacted the 2006 uh, arbitration model law, which is uh, 2013 and 14, uh, Korean court has broader power to support and supervise arbitration. Principally, uh, Michael, it's right that the court has a vest power, but uh, having had the long history that the court doesn't 
um, you know, interfere or meddle into the arbitration, judges are very reluctant to do so. For example, we have several arbitration cases where the uh, decision of the arbitrator, arbitrator was a challenge at the court. When we go to the court, either as appointment of the arbitrator or they set aside the uh, interim injunctions or decisions by the arbitrators, generally the first reaction from the court is why you bring this matter to, to the court? I think that the, you, should, you should have resolved all this issue at the arbitration. And then we have to explain to the judge that um, given the new mother law system, the court has a vast majority of the power. So we, you have to go through the long process of convincing the court that the court has a power. Ultimately, court understands the problem we have in our system is that we don't have any specialized tribunal focusing on arbitration. Recently, Supreme Court recently had enacted assigned two uh, tribunal that has to be dealing with the all arbitration methods. So it, it's a gradually becoming more specialized tribunal. But previously, any arbitration method, you know, related litigation are assigned to any judges. So you have to go through all the process. And because of that, uh, somehow such a type of injunction or unknown uh, actions or proactive intervention by the court is uh, a bit a bit difficult. I wouldn't say it's impossible. It's a bit difficult given the long history of courts non-interventionist uh, policy or practices. Thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, thank you very much to all the panelists for setting the scene for us with all of these stories from their experiences dealing with uh, situations where the party's been un uncooperative or uh, uh, non-responding. Uh, this sets seen nicely for us to move into the second part of our, our webinar, where we will look into each uh, situation and the panelists will discuss from the perspective of counsel and also from the perspective of the arbitrator, how one should deal with, with that situation. The first situation we're gonna deal with is a situation where you have a non-participating respondent. You'll see, from the stories that we've been told that that's actually quite a common situation. And Julia will, will kick us off on this one with her comments on the from the perspective of counsel. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I would say everyone knows uh, there are various reasons why respondent might decide not to participate. Uh, but regardless of the reasons behind the respondent's decision not to participate, uh, a practical question which remains is what happens in case of the other party's failure to participate and how can arbitrators ensure they will render an enforceable ex parte award? So in this regard, I would like to point out three things to note here from the claimant's counsel's perspective. The first one is about the court. Once you file a notice of arbitration, SIC, and other arbitral institution secretaria will ask for advances on costs equally from both parties. However, where the respondent does not participate, the claimant needs to pay all advances on costs for both parties before the tribunal can be appointed, hear the case, and issue the award. The claimant must be prepared for this and to recover their costs in enforcement proceedings against the respondent. And the second point is about arbitration process and hearing stage. From a procedural point of view, most arbitration rules provide that in the absence of the respondent participation, the arbitration proceedings will nevertheless continue on an ex parte basis. The claimant should prepare their case as per normal for example, they need to file the statement of claim and witness statement. And the tribunal should have a merits hearing where the claimant will present oral opening and closing submissions, and the claimant's witness shall attend the hearing to be examined by the tribunal members in case the tribunal has an, any question for the witness. And according to the New York Convention, Article 5B, 
the recognition and enforcement of the award may be refused uh, where the losing party was not given proper notice of the appointment of the arbitrator or of the arbitration proceedings or was otherwise unable to present his case. In light of the, uh, this fact, the first and foremost is to ensure that the other party is aware of the ongoing arbitration proceedings. This includes ensuring that the other party has been properly notified of the commencement of the arbitration proceedings and has received the request or notice of arbitration. And this also applies to other procedural steps during the course of an arbitration. In practice, ensuring that the other party has received all notification, documents, and correspondence related to the case can easily be proven from read and delivery receipts for every email exchanges and by, by providing hard copies of all documents and correspondence on the record together with proof of delivery. An arbitrary institution also has to ensure that the arbitrators will check whether the other party has been duly and timely notified about each and every step of the arbitration proceedings and has received every single document submitted on the record is important in order not to face challenge at the enforcement stage. And finally, uh, the claimant should expect that if the respondent uh, does not uh, participate in the arbitration process, the respondent is most likely choosing to fight the case only at the stage where the claimant tries to enforce its award against the respondent. This usually takes place in the respondent's home country before the respondent's national court because that's where the respondent has assets. So throughout the whole arbitration process, the claimant must keep one eye on this path and ensure that any award it obtains is enforceable. If the respondent has no assets overseas, then from the beginning of the case, the claimants need to ensure that the award can be enforced against the respondent in his home country at his national court. This usually starts with the confirming basic jurisdiction and recognition issues like whether the respondent comes from the New York Convention. So this is uh, my part I prepare uh, from the claimant's counsel's perspective, and the robot will also add uh, more comments on this. Yeah, from speaking from the uh, perspective of, of counsel, um, some clients uh, are um, a little upset that there's not the equivalent of a default judgment rule. And they react, you know, what, what do you mean, you know, we, ha we have to submit submissions and evidence and, and witness statements if the other side is not showing up? Uh, and of course, the, the SEAC rules, like, uh, like other institutional rules, I think it's uh, rule 24.3, uh, specifies that if a party doesn't show up at the hearing, uh, that uh, the, the tribunal shall make the award based on the submissions and evidence before it. So uh, the tribunal is rule bound to consider um, what the submissions say and, and, and what the evidence is in making an award and can't simply issue a default award, which leads to the question as a practical matter, um, is this all perfunctory? Uh, is it as a practical matter, ever possible for a respondent uh, to win if they don't show up. Uh, personally, I have not heard of any such circumstance, but uh, I, I have been tested uh, when I have been counsel and the respondent hasn't shown up. And I think that it really does uh, help the credibility of the award if the tribunal um, does express some skepticism and in fact, make sure that the claimant has in fact made out its case. Um, now, I, I think that as counsel, we would always prefer, and I think that arbitrators probably agree, we would always prefer that the respondent shows up. I mean, it certainly makes our job easier, either as counsel or as the tribunal, uh, to, to argue the case, to write an award when the respondent does show up. Um, 
But I, I think that we have to be careful that we don't have an inappropriate bias uh, against a, re a respondent that does not show up. I think that there's always a reason why, and it's not always because they concede that they have no case. I mean, the claimant is always going to argue if the respondent had any case, they would show up and they would argue it before this tribunal. And that, that might be true in, in most cases, but there may be cases where that's, that's not true. You might have a, a respondent that's in difficult uh, financial circumstances, and they might have a fixed budget uh, to fight their legal battles and, and just determine, depending on where they are, that it might be better. It might make more sense and be more rational uh, to sit back and to not fight the case at the arbitration stage and consider their options um, at the enforcement stage. Uh, it, it's all a question of, of, what the, um, uh, of what the motivations are, what the incentives are, given the circumstances that the respondent fi finds itself in. You know, it, it's Charlie Munger who said, you know, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And I think that that's true and, and explains why um, some respondents, uh, particularly in certain jurisdictions, are more likely to not show up and fight in the, in the arbitration. Um, just because a respondent doesn't show up doesn't mean that they don't have a case. And I give you one more war story uh, where uh, the, the jurisdiction does not have all of the um, Supreme Court cases published. And so you have to do your homework to try to, to track down your precedents. Uh, and we relied on an expert uh, to plead the law of that particular country. And the respondent didn't show up, but, but stayed in the case long enough to appoint uh, an arbitrator. And so we get to the hearing and the expert is testifying as an expert. And the wing arbitrator presents an adverse authority, uh, a Supreme Court decision uh, that our expert had missed. Um, and gave, gave him an opportunity to review it, um, and it was clearly adverse. There were mixed decisions, you know, where the Supreme Court came out different ways in different cases. And so we, we were able to come back uh, and say, well, yes, there is this case, but there are other cases that, um, that came out on the other side. But it was clearly adverse authority that was very difficult to distinguish on the facts. And our experts uh, on, on the stand said, um, well, our, our country is a civil law jurisdiction and we're not really bound by the principle of stare decisis. I think this decision is wrong and the other cases were correctly decided. And you, you never want to get to a hearing um, and, and find out, you know, from one of the arbitrators that there's other authority out there uh, that could have given the respondent a, a, a strong case had they decided to, to show up and argue the case. Um, in terms of suggestions for what we might do um, as counsel, I, I think that uh, you have to remember that, that you have to see the tribunal as your ally and you're trying to assist the tribunal to draft an enforceable award. Um, and so what, one thing that, um, uh, that can help is, uh, and I've seen sub tribunals do it, is to take a transcript of all of the important procedural conferences and make sure that, uh, that the respondent knows exactly what was discussed and decided at those procedural hearings. Um, I've seen cases where uh, as claimant, we've made sure to not only send email communications, but um, make sure that there's proof of delivery for all important submissions. Um, that, that's difficult though in a case, that I, I had one case where uh, the respondent had appointed counsel for purposes of receiving all, all of the documents in the arbitration and then the council uh, disappeared, uh, moved offices, all of the deliveries were refused after that. And it was difficult to find where that lawyer went to even when looking online and, and looking up the profile uh, on the bar. So um, th things can happen that can make it difficult even when you're trying very hard uh, to, to make sure that, that you end up with an enforceable award. Uh, one, one more final uh, war story uh, on, on this point of, of what council can do. Um, th there was one case where we knew that we were going to need to enforce the award in a um, Muslim country where it is sometimes difficult to enforce arbitral awards. And our witness was a Muslim witness. And so we decided um, 
and this was actually suggested by one of the members of the tribunal who was also Muslim and appointed by the institution uh, on behalf of the respondent, that maybe it would be better just, just to make sure that there's no question about the enforceability of this award uh, to have the witnesses testify under oath, swearing an oath on the Quran. Great idea, no objections. The witness sits down in the witness box, swears the oath, uh, and then at the end of the, the testimony, uh, right at the point where the tribunal is about to release the witness, uh, the witness blurts out, oh, a little earlier I swore an oath on the Quran, but, but this, this book, and he holds up the book, this is not a Quran. He <laughs> says, this is a translation of the Quran. And um, in Islam, of course, a translation of the Quran is not the same as a Quran. Uh, for Christians, a translation of the Bible, you know, is, is just as sacred as, uh, as, as the original text, uh, but that's not the case. And so because we had taken this step just to make sure that the award would be enforceable, to make sure that, that we had an oath on the Quran, well, then we had a defective oath. And so we, we had to um, take a break, uh, have somebody go out and find a Quran that was written in Arabic, uh, come back and have the witness um, affirm uh, that everything that he testified uh, to uh, in the earlier session was, was true and, and equally valid as if he had taken the oath uh, on the Quran from the very beginning. So there, there are things that you can do to try to uh, improve the chances of getting an enforceable award, uh, but there are also pitfalls. And so, you know, whenever a respondent does not show up, uh, I think that you can expect the unexpected. Thank you very much, uh, Robert and Julian. You both brought a very important point about unresponsive uh, uh, respondents, which is that it is still uh, incumbent on the claimant to prove its case. Uh, and as Robert said, there is no default award in an arbitration. The other point you brought up, Robert, is it possible for a claimant in that situation not to win? And it is possible. Uh, it certainly is possible. I've been in a situation where we had a claimant with an unresponsive respondent, and there was one part of the claim which uh, they did not make out. Even though we pointed out to them what was missing, they didn't make it out, and, and they didn't succeed in that claim. So it is very, very possible. But let, let's now hear from EY from the perspective of arbitrator. You know, what, what are the, the points that an arbitrator would need to ensure to make sure the award is enforceable against a non-participating respondent? Yes, I think that the tribunal generally be, would become proactive to ensure the award is enforceable and avoid any challenges on due process, especially the right to be heard of the respondent. So these uh, issues, as Julia pointed out, the service of process, the proper notice of the respondent is very important. So the arbitral tribunal may do this uh, throughout the entire process of the arbitration, such as a procedural order, a procedural timetable, document production, especially procedural timetable should be uh, uh, constituted to accommodate the time that the respondent would put their case, even though they determined not to do so. Now, the more important thing is the hearing phase. So now it appears that the respondent hasn't attended, didn't make any submissions and claimant uh, expecting the hearing on its own. Now, claimant should not get a free pass to win without substantiating its claims. It's understandable for arbitrators to be proactive, but how far it could go. If arbitrator become too inquisitorial, what consequences would it have? Well, certainly claimant should prepare all aspects of issues as there will not be a narrow down issues in disputes, which would otherwise be the case in ordinary case. Potentially every fact can be scrutinized and challenged by the tribunal. Claimant may fight against an invisible opponent. <coughs> Every arbitration is different. <coughs> Arbitrator has a vast majority of discretion as to the way how arbitration is conducted. Um, arbitrator cannot entirely free from the legal and cultural background. But the question is what the best practice is. Uh, there should be a right balance so that the uncooperative respondent is not getting the arbitrator 
as its own defense counsel for free. So while it's okay for arbitrator to become proactive, but there should be certain limit. So from my suggest, my uh, experiences and uh, observations I have had, I suggest that as long as arbitrator are ensured that there is proper notice on the respondent by way of service of process and notifications, then arbit and, and then it is it is up to the respondent that they intentionally deliberately chose not to appear, not to put their case. And arbitrator shouldn't be too much giving hands uh, for the respondent. But one thing, the lastly, one thing that still arbitrator has to be inquisitorial is about the existence of arbitration agreement. Uh, if uh, the other party attend and you know, many times, unless they raise a challenge of jurisdiction, uh, arbitration agreement is not disputed. However, if certain arbitration, the parties are, you know, the claims are assigned and contracts were assigned or parties were changed, then I guess that arbitrator may need to investigate uh, in detail as to the validity of the arbitration agreement, unless even though it is not uh, highly disputed on the case. Thank you. What my question for you, EY, and you brought a very interesting point about the extent to which the tribunal should test the case of the claimant where the respondent is, is not participating. If there were witnesses, to what extent would the tribunal cross-examine those witnesses to be satisfied about the evidence that was before the tribunal? Yeah, um, I think that the uh, as uh, <clears throat> Robert has uh, brought uh, experience, uh, the way the arbitrator tried to examine the witness in full, doing the direct examination and cross-examination, I don't think that it's a good idea. However, to the extent that the tribunal wants to establish the facts, because it's ultimately responsibility of the tribunal to establish effects, to apply the law. So if there's a certain issues that are not clear enough in the submission of the statement of the witness, then I think that it's up to the arbitrator to do a proper inquiry to the uh, witness. I wouldn't use the term cross-examination because as a, an arbitrator, I wouldn't put my shoes onto the respondent side, but I would put certain questions to the, to the witness, as long as those uh, questions are very important to establish uh, fundamental facts. So to that extent, I think that it should be okay for the tribunal to do it. But I believe that there are certainly a limit. So if the tribunal mimic as if it were, uh, you know, respondent counsel, I think that it's, uh, again, going too far and cross the line of the best practice. Thank you. Stephen, could I just jump in there and uh, yes. perhaps offer a, a view on this? Uh, one, one option for the arbitrator would be to point out to counsel for claimant that there are certain aspects of the case that the arbitrator would like to hear more evidence on, and then leave it to counsel for the claimant to decide whether he wants to lead evidence from the witness or not. So that's, that's one possible option without actually raising the questions uh, himself. Uh, the other, of course, is, as you say, the tribunal itself could offer or could ask questions of the witness. And then after following up with uh, with the counsel to ask whether the counsel has any further questions for the witness arising from the questions of the tribunal, in which event then I think the, the risk of being seen as overly interventionist uh, may be minimized. But can I also offer a, a different perspective from the perspective of, of, of claim and counsel. Uh, I, I, th I think it may be in some instances good practice for claim and counsel to look at what are the arguments or potential arguments that a respondent could raise and raise that and deal with that even if the respondent is not represented or is not participating in the proceedings simply because it allows the arbitrator then on those submissions to come out with a reasoned award that deals with these issues 
and that is useful and I think important when it comes to enforcement because it reduces the possibility of the respondent turning up and saying this is a default argument, default mm -hmm. judgment, the merits were not considered when in fact the merits were raised by the claimant themselves, you know, on, on behalf of the respondent and the tribunal then made a, a decision one way or the other on it. And in Stephen's example where the tribunal didn't allow certain claims, even though the respondent was not represented. To me, I think that's that, that's an indication of a good award because the arbitrator or the tribunal is not blindly just rubber stamping what is put before it. And I think that will then allow the enforcing claimant to argue that this is, this is really a, an award on the merits, even though the respondent didn't participate. Uh, thank, thank you for those comments. This is a topic that we could probably spend the, the rest of this webinar talking about. It's a very common situation, but we do have to move on with, with other situations that we want to discuss. The next one is uh, a situation where the respondent is there participating, uh, but is clearly uh, disruptive of the process, clearly trying to delay the procedure uh, with wholly unwarranted timelines. Uh, what what do, does the council in that situation for the claimant do? Uh, Robert, would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I think that we need to distinguish between um, the beginning of the case uh, and and things that come up later on in the case. I mean, as council, I, I have no problem if the respondent makes a proposal for a timeline at the beginning of the case, and if, if there's no agreement, you, you ask for a ruling from the tribunal. Um, you know, the, the respondent's entitled to ask for bifurcation. Um, there might be circumstances where it is reasonable to ask for a very long timeline. There are some cases where uh, the parties are waiting on some important event uh, that, that might have an impact on the case. I, I don't have any, any problem at the very beginning uh, if the respondent does not agree and, and the tribunal needs to decide on, uh, on a timeline where the, the claimant and the respondent have, um, have made different proposals. It, it's mu much more concerning to me uh, the behavior of, res of a respondent after the timeline has been set uh, to not respect uh, what, what has been decided at the beginning of the case. Um, and, and in this case, uh, I, there, there are a lot of war stories, but I, I don't think that it's necessarily the case that it's always the respondent um, that's, that's abusing uh, what, what has already been determined um, at an earlier stage. Um, one, one particular case uh, comes to mind, uh, a fairly recent war story, where um, after the hearing, uh, the parties had agreed to have uh, post-hearing briefs and had specifically decided that there would be no page limit because they would be limited, because they were both under time pressure. I think that the post-hearing briefs would be due in 10 days or two weeks. It, it was a very tight timeline. So there were no page limits. And so we, we went ahead and, and finalized our brief. And then the day before it's due, uh, the respondent applies uh, for an extension of time to file the post-hearing briefs and asks for a two-week extension, uh, which the tribunal granted. And then two weeks later, uh, they file a brief that's 150 pages long in six point font. So they were clearly busy the whole time. And of course our brief was done. We didn't rewrite it, try to, try to lengthen it. And as counsel, you're, you're always hoping that, um, that the tribunal's paying attention uh, and keeping track of these things and is ready to deal with that at the appropriate stage you know, when it comes to the costs award. Um, and unfortunately, you know, tribunals sometimes don't always remember uh, and aren't really paying uh, as close attention to the back and forth uh, between the council as, as council sometimes hopes and, and maybe expects. Thank you, Robert. Well, I want to turn to the perspective of the arbitrator now, Michael. How does the arbitrator deal with a situation like this? I imagine it requires a lot of tact and experience to make sure you get the balance right between the giving uh, the uh, due process to the respondent, but also not allowing them to abuse it. Well, Stephen, it's, it's a question of judgment. It's a question of judgment and experience. And uh, occasionally one strikes counsel who are aggressive, not, not frequently, but it does happen. And it's, it's always struck me as rather strange that a counsel would regard itself as uh, uh, at war with the tribunal as well as the other side when I was counsel, I tried to get the tribunal on my side. 
but um, perhaps some people, I have seen some people, uh, arbitrators who are intimidated in the front, in, in the face of a, a very strong counsel who screams lack of due process, lack of due process. Uh, so one has to have the confidence and judgment to know when to intervene and, and, and when to draw the line. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the count, that arbitrator should should be heavy-handed and chop off people. Um, he's always got to remember that uh, each side has to be given a, a reasonable opportunity to present its case. And if it does need um, an extension of time, then, then that's permitted. And sometimes you go just a little bit further than that. But then you come to a point where you have to draw the line and, and um, give effect to your other ability, your other responsibility, uh, which is not simply to make sure that each party has a res reasonable opportunity to present its case, uh, but to make sure that the case is dealt with in a reasonable and expeditious manner and in a manner which is cost effective. So it's judgment as to when you, when you exercise your, your authority and say no and move on. And, and, and you've got to have a degree of courage. Um, I was going to tell a little war story too, which, is, which sort of indirectly relates to wasting time or perhaps, perhaps uh, scaring the tribunal a bit. But I was reminded of a case where, where again, it was one of those not frequent cases where counsel was a little bit aggressive during the proceedings, challenging things as they, uh, uh, particularly matters which were decided um, against, um, against counsel's um, uh, submissions. And, uh, and uh, we'd set down a two week hearing for, for this case. And uh, a, a month or two before the hearing, this difficult counsel wrote to the tribunal and said, look, we've considered, we've considered all the issues in this case and we're firmly of the view that two weeks is not long enough for the hearing. So I contacted my co-arbitrators and asked whether they could um, provide some days in the third week so that we could have a longer hearing. Unfortunately, they were not available. I was. So I persuaded them uh, to agree to sit uh, on the weekend between week one and week two. And I told this difficult council the tribunal is prepared to sit on the weekend. Now, this council was normally very, very um, efficient in responding to anything which the tribunal said or the, the other party said. On this occasion, however, there was no response. We duly assembled in Washington for the hearing. And I had in the back of my mind the fact that, uh, that there'd been no response to our offer of a weekend. So I thought I better have this out because to be quite frank, I didn't entirely trust counsel having regard to counsel's previous actions in the course of the arbitration. So I, I, was, I said to counsel, you haven't responded to our offer to sit on the weekend. And uh, counsel stood up, no, 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 no. We don't sit on the weekend. I said, very well. So the case proceeded. I was astounded at how slow this counsel was in cross-examining uh, the other side's witnesses, thinking it seemed to me that they had all the time in the world when they'd said to me, when counsel had said to me that time was too short. Anyway, it's up to counsel to decide how to spend its time. And of course, we were on a chess clock basis. Uh, so we got more or less to the end of the hearing. And on the very last day of the hearing, counsel got up and delivered what I'd only describe as a, a very carefully prepared speech which went on for some 10, possibly 12 minutes, saying that 
there was not nearly enough time to present the party's case. There was a, a, a very unfair um, um, a lack of due process accorded to this party. They had been uh, totally unable to fully present their case or even adequately present their case. And they were reserving all their rights. And uh, it, it was very carefully prepared and orchestrated, obviously to set up, um, uh, set up a, a challenge to the award should it go against them. So having listened to this, um, I, I then responded on behalf of the tribunal. And uh, I, I thought carefully what I should say and what I said was that uh, I heard counsel and I noted counsel's submissions on lack of time. And I said it was not, the tribunal was not intending to debate whether or not uh, that party had sufficient time. The record would speak for itself. But I said I wanted to put on the record that the tribunal had offered the parties uh, an extra two days on the weekend and that this party had declined. And I said no more. And uh, uh, in, in due course, the award wasn't entirely in, to the favour of this party, but there was no challenge to the award. So these, these are matters of judgment. Uh, you, you have to give a reasonable amount of leeway you have to decide that there are circumstances where a party is entirely justified in seeking time. There are circumstances where perhaps a little bit of extra time is not really fully justified, but you do give a little leeway to counsel. No one's perfect, but if they go too far and you have to decide when a situation has gone too far, you must have the courage to properly manage the proceedings and make appropriate orders and not worry about threats of lack of due process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a very interesting discussion. And uh, this topic as the early one is one where, you know, given the, <coughs> the, the judgment calls that involve is one we could go on talking uh, further about, but we do have to move on. I've got at least two more situations I want to try and cover before we wrap up. Uh, the third situation is probably one as well which requires a sub-judgment call, <laughs> uh, particularly on the part of the arbitrator, and that's a situation where an unmeritorious challenge is brought against a tribunal member or all the tribunal members, uh, again, simply to delay and, and trip up the arbitration process. Michael, would you like to comment on that uh, from the perspective of counsel? Yeah. What, what, what does a tribunal member do in the circumstances like that? Yes, well, that's, that's an, an interesting one. Um, I've been on a tribunal which I was chairing where a co-arbitrator was challenged and uh, I've been on um, two tribunals actually where, where uh, one member of the tribunal not being me was challenged and then very recently the whole tribunal was challenged. Now in the first case where I was presiding arbitrator, it's an ICC case and uh, a co-arbitrator was challenged. Uh, the challenge I didn't think was very persuasive. Uh, and um, the, the person who was challenged, who was a distinguished arbitrator from the Philippines, who I thought highly of, he, he did something which I thought was unwise. He wrote about a 25 page submission uh, in favor of his position and arguing against the challenge. And it was not only detailed, it was quite emotive and very spirited. Now, I thought he did the wrong thing. I can understand that he was upset that he was challenged and that he believed he shouldn't stand down. And I think he was right in that. I don't think he should have stood down, but he engaged in such a strong, detailed and spirited manner that he put himself in a position of conflict with the party to the arbitration. That an arbitrator cannot do. Cannot do. 
I think if an arbitrator is challenged, the arbitrator, if the arbitrator says anything, the arbitrator must only make factual statements, and not submissions. Let the facts speak for themselves. So the arbitrator should say, no, I did not call a witness. No, I did not tear up a document. But you mustn't make submissions because it's inconsistent, in my view, with the role of a tribunal if it puts itself in a position of conflict with a party to the proceedings. And that's always been my my golden rule. And I've always followed that. And, uh, you know, the ICC um, policy is always when there's a challenge to ask um, the tribunal as well as the person challenged whether or not they wish to say anything. And I rarely do, unless there's a factual matter, excuse me, matter I wish to draw to the attention of the tribunal, of the, uh, of the body considering the challenge. But one has to be very, very careful. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, Samuel, just uh, very quickly, given uh, looking at the time very quickly, can you give uh, the council's perspective on the situation? Yeah, um, I, I think it can be summed up in perhaps two words. You have to be a Zen warrior. In other words, you've got to calm things down. You've got to ensure that language use is not intemperate. Uh, because the last thing you want is to provoke or induce the arbitrator to take the bait, which challenging counsel will be putting out there to just make sure that the arbitrator either slips up, say something inadvertently, which could then be extrapolated to mean bias or lack of consideration or what have you. So as opposing counsel, a counsel opposing the challenge, have a good handle on the proceedings. Try and calm things down. Very important to ensure that when you deal with the challenge, you substantively set out in very measured language, grounds and facts which will allow the tribunal to consider and decide on the challenge objectively. So council has a very important role in, I think, assisting the tribunal whenever a challenge is, is mounted. And you know, very often we do come across council who deliberately will try to provoke a response from an arbitrator or from a tribunal. And, and that's part of the game, right? The moment you say something out of whack or out of tune and that becomes a basis for alleging bias and stuff. So, so have a good handle on things to try and calm things down. Thank you very much, Samuel. Well, we, we're, we've got a few minutes left, and I just want to very, very then quickly touch on, on another situation, which is where uh, something which EY had spoken about when he, when he first spoke about uh, his war story at the beginning, where there are parallel proceedings brought, uh, court proceedings in other jurisdictions to disrupt the arbitration. You know, what does one do? How does one handle that situation? As EY, uh, since you, you introduced us, and, briefly tell us how, how you would deal with a situation like that. Sure, yeah, I'll talk about briefly. You could think uh, two things. When the litigation is filed already for in courts, then I think that you should immediately go to file an arbitration in a proper forum. We, I did uh, this uh, quite a while ago in the Korean uh, arbitration. And then the issue, there are two issues. Number one, how you could convince the tribunal that the, uh, they have a power because the other side actually certainly raised an issue of a pending litigation overseas. So then they intimidated the tribunal that the, the tribunal should not proceed. And we were successful in persuading the tribunal that under the Arbitration Act modeled after the Unsitra model law, tribunal has a power to proceed despite the fact that there is a pending litigation. Secondly, again, as I mentioned, uh, at the time, it was uh, before the 2006 model law. So the Korean court was not much uh, helpful in terms of uh, having an injunction against the foreign court. So what we have thought about is uh, three things in the arbitration. First thing is that we got the jurisdictional award from the outset, from the arbitrator, and we submit this jurisdictional award to the Indonesian court. And finally, we were able to submit this and the Indonesian court were uh, reviewing the jurisdictional award by the arbitral award finally determined that they don't have any jurisdiction and they dismissed the case. That's uh, one thing that you could think about in terms of a strategy. The second thing is that to get the uh, anti-suit injunction, 
from the tribunal. So then if we get uh, the anti-suit injunction, then it could become a burden onto the uh, respondent side. We have actually thought about this, but uh, we didn't go through because after all, because of the jurisdictional award rendered by the tribunal, respondent determined to drop the Indonesian litigation and come back to the arbitration. The third thing that we considered is a damage action against the respondent for their wrongful lit litigation, which is in violation of arbitration agreement. That has also been considered in our late arbitration. So these three items are the strategic uh, points that you could consider to uh, fight against the disruption made by the other side by filing a foreign litigation. Thank you. Thank you very much, you are. I think we're actually uh, at 5.15, but as uh, perhaps uh, the gentleman on the panel uh, will, I'd like to leave the last word to uh, our lady on the panel, to Julia, if you could very quickly just uh, close our proceedings by giving your, your thoughts uh, on the oh. situation. Okay, uh, so when there is an application from the respondent side, or there, there is arbitration close, and uh, a respondent applied to his national court for a declaration that the tribunal has no jurisdiction. Uh, and I think this uh, shall be treated very carefully because many jurisdictions have rules saying that if you challenge the court's jurisdiction and lose, you, you are automatically taken to have submitted to the jurisdiction of that court. Of course, depending upon the, the, the country's court rule. Uh, therefore, I think uh, where the respondent applies to his national court, uh, the best thing to do is to ignore those court proceedings and proceed with arbitration, even if it ends up being a single party arbitration against the non-responsive respondent. That way, the claimant maintains his consistent stand that the proper forum is arbitration and the claimant has never submitted to the jurisdiction of any national court. Yeah, this is just my idea. Thank you very much, Julia. Well, this unfortunately brings us to the end of our webinar. There's certainly been a lot of interesting issues that we could keep discussing. I would love to keep discussing these issues with, with our excellent panelists, but we do have to bring proceedings to a close. And it reminds, uh, remains for me to thank Michael, Robert, Samuel, Julia, and EY for joining us today. Uh, and the SIC for inviting us all to speak at this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you.